Hi, I'm David Yang, co-founder and instructor here at Fullstack Academy, and welcome to our first episode of Alumni Stories, where we meet and talk to some of our Fullstack alumni and see what they're up to now. Uh, today I'm really excited to have Christian Sakai and David Chang in the studio, and they'll talk a little bit about what they're up to. So why don't we start with you, David? What did, um, tell me a little bit about before, what your life was like before you came to Fullstack. Yeah, my background is actually in finance. I was in mergers and acquisitions and corporate strategy. Um, and then I went to my family business, which was, which was an import and export business in the handbag industry. So very different. Um, and then I wanted to pursue tech. That's originally my interest. Um, you know, in undergrad, I was an industrial engineer. So I looked at a couple programs, quite a bit of them, and I decided to go to Full Stack Academy. All right, awesome. And what about you, Christian? Uh, my background was also in industrial engineering. After I graduated from my undergrad, uh, I uh, went to be a sales engineer at a one biodiesel company. And then at a what company? A biodiesel company. Okay, biodiesel. Right. Uh, after that, I decided to that it was not right for me. Um, I was always focused on the engineering, but industrial engineering is more on the management side. Okay. So I, I thought maybe I tried something else. So I did some uh, literature, and then I worked at a nonprofit organization, and then decided it was not for me either. And I was doing some soul searching, and I remember that I always like to build things, and that's how I came into contact with programming. And while I was searching for some programs and boot camps, that's why I found Full Stack Academy. So, you know, I hear this a lot, is that I was feeling um, like this desire to be a creator, to be a builder. How did you first kind of trip into that feeling of um, that tension between what you wanted to do and what you were doing? And then how did you get started? Like, what was the first thing you did that made programming? Was it something like Code Academy? Was it a friend tell you? And, and Christian, why don't you start us there? Um, I started doing Code Academy. That's okay. like, actually, I started doing, I started reading some materials about programming and how do you, uh, how you want to get into programming. And I remember this one article about Obama said that everybody has to code. I think it was <laughs> Obama, right? Well, I, I was, um, and then watched this one video from Facebook that, you know, if you're a coder, you're basically, this is, uh, you're a wizard, you know? Mm. Like, it's, a, it's basically one step of becoming a wizard, but not really a wizard. But you can do a lot of things with code. So that's how get me really into it. And I started to like, oh, let's, Try this out. I remember I came into contact with programming when I was in undergrad, but it was very different back then because mm -hmm. because programming back then you didn't see the result like right away. I think that was the barrier at that I time. See. What and programming languages were you learning? It was, I'm, I was using Visual Basic. Okay. Yeah. And very 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 uh, mundane stuff like loops and stuff. I was thinking this is not really interesting, but. With programming nowadays, you have so many things uh, to create, so many interesting things, and you can actually see the result. Yeah. Like Code Academy did that right, rightly. So you, you put some code, and then you output the result. That's what get me excited. So I what about you, David? To, yeah. What was your first experience with coding? Like, what was the first thing you did, the first thing you wrote? Um, that was probably in high school when um, I think a lot of people took a C++ class, um, learn about the basics of algorithms and things like that. Um, you know, I, similar to how Christian felt, a lot of it, you know, it didn't feel as engaging as it, as it is now. You know, what made me really want to dive deeper into um, coding was the trend in kind of the startups now that are actually solving uh, problems um, for normal people. So hmm. if you look at the, you know, last five, six years, there's a lot of technologies out there that are solving, you know, everyday um, problems, whether it's, you know, with obviously, you know, have examples like Uber, um, you know, examples like Instacart, things like that. Those things are helping, you know, people in every, you know, every day. So we wanted, you know, I wanted to um, solve a problem. So um, be able to do that. So when you came into Full Stack, you already knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur, to be a builder. Did you know what you wanted to build at that point? Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to build. I definitely had a few ideas. Um, Ninth Beat is actually an idea that came about through a project uh -huh. um, at Full Stack. So that's very exciting. I went in with actually a couple of different ideas. I see. So um, i like curious how you two met at Full Stack. How do, how do we meet up? Yeah, how do you meet up? Or what what oh. made you decide to work together out of coming after, after coming out of Full Stack? Um, I think it was because I was the, uh, a teaching fellow back then. And I remember uh, at the end of my, two months before at the end of my uh, contract at Full Stack, 
I, so I always sit, I always sat next to the students because I always need monitors, and they they didn't have monitors back then in, in the teachers in the teachers area. So I sat next to the students. I oftentimes I sat with David, hmm. um, and he always asked me questions. And because I was there, so I was just okay. This is how we do it, and he always I just always answer it. And apparently I don't know. Uh, so what made you decide to? I think um, <laughs> it was an organic situation mm. where we work well together, and you know, Ninth Beat um, is actually solving you know a problem for him. Christian is actually a musician. I see. Um, so the idea kind of came about while we were brainstorming. So. so tell us a little bit more about Ninth Beat. What what is the uh, goal of Ninth Beat? What is it like? What do people do on it? Um, yeah. Well, maybe we can start with. Uh, what is Ninth Beat? What is what is the elevator pitch for Ninth Beat? Sure. So Ninth Beat is a marketplace for musicians. It's um, C to C, as in it's strictly musician to musician. Okay. So if you think about um, the used instrument marketplace, um, right now it's primarily offline. As you go into kind of the local brick and mortar consignment shops. Um, the trend in shopping is actually taking that offline portion and allowing consumers to buy and shop from each other. So we're trying to not cut out the middleman, but allow musicians to kind of use technology to better interact with each other, to create a platform for where they can securely and easily um, trade with each other. And so, you know, in the first kind of dot-com boom, we have the biggest player, eBay, in this space. Yeah. What are the things that are kind of making this um, this space open for, for innovation again? Sure. Um, I'll answer that. Um, so if you look at what eBay has done, they've created a great place for right now um, sellers, like stores, right? So if mm -hmm. you think about the last time a consumer actually sold on eBay, it's probably, um, there's not too many people anymore. It's usually like these big stores and buyers, you know, as a consumer, you'll buy from eBay. But, you know, that ecosystem where you have to create um, a lot of transactions to gain trust is kind of outdated. If you look at the trends in uh, marketplaces sp specific to industries, like in fashion, there's, um, you know, there's startups specifically for handbags alone. There's startups specifically for clothing, um, jewelry, things like that. So then, you know, fashion is generally the forefront of, you know, e-commerce, right? So mm -hmm. then we want to take a lot of what's trending and what has worked in fashion to the music industry. Um, so that's why you know, we're, we created Ninth Beat. So. You know what's interesting, I recently was trying to sell something on eBay and I realized that um, one thing I wanted to do was email with the person who bought, you know, I was selling my laptop mm -hmm. and I wanted to email with that person so that I knew that they were real because they were having me ship this thing to mm -hmm. someplace in Eastern Europe. And eBay makes it really hard to communicate with between the seller and the buyer. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that makes it a very, you know, sterile transaction. So exactly. is there something that you guys were thinking about that could actually make this more like connected between seller and buyer, make that con transaction uh, sure. feel more authentic? Um, Christian, you want to take Yeah, this? definitely. Um, so we have this chat feature, which is which allows uh, people to chat in, in the chat room okay. for every uh, items that they want. And um, um, basically, it's all the buyers and people who are interested. So buyers can, so everybody can basically see all the uh, communication, all the things that they describe, all the things that they ask. They can see it's very transparent. So all the historic chat records for every item are visible on the store. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So what's been more of a trend is just transparency, right? If you look at social media, everything is out there. Yeah. So when people want to buy from each other, they, they don't want a direct message and, you know, I don't even know if the, the buyer read it or not. So, you know, our shopping platform, our marketplace is very similar to if you were to just go on Instagram, except you're buying and selling. So if you have a, have a question, it's public, you know, and then it creates just more of a, um, more engagement and a trust between the users. Yeah. What are some of the uh, key metrics that you guys are tracking for Ninth Beat? What are the things that you're excited about growing and what are the things you're looking at? I'll answer that one. Um, I think for us right now, obviously users, right? But um, we don't want, you know, the user count doesn't mean anything if the user is not a musician or not relevant. So we are, what's relevant for us is the amount of users, the engagement. So we look at conversion rates across the board, across the whole funnel. Um, obviously the end goal will be to get a transaction. So we'll, those rates are important. Um, on the seller side, we look at, you know, 
how many people come in become actually a seller. Hmm. And everything we do in terms of the user experience for our product is to limit barriers um, of entry to selling or buying. So, you know, we will like, you know, everything we do, we're like, okay, how do we eliminate the clicks, right? Within three clicks, you can uh, make an offer or buy something on our site. Within three, three clicks, you can actually sell something. We really lower the barriers of entry. That's true. I noticed that you know on Craigslist, if I have to take a picture on my phone and get it to my computer, that friction makes me less likely to sell something. Yeah. Is mobile important for Ninth Beat, or are you guys on mobile? Or very important. So we decided to. Um, we started on web, obviously, but um, even on the web, our website is responsive, and you can actually take a picture right away. What does that mean, responsive? Um, that it's actually uh, on mobile. It's uh, it's viewed uh, with. It's nicely viewed. Okay, so it looks good on a mobile. It looks phone. good on a mobile. Okay. Um, it, you can also take picture right away, and you can also um, just post it uh, using your uh, mobile phone camera. I see. So everything can be done on the everything on can the be done on a mobile app. Um, you know, you, you David, you mentioned something that there was a project at Fullstack that inspired Ninth Beat. What was that project, and maybe why did it inspire this this startup? Um, so it was the e-commerce uh, project that we worked on. Okay, and. You know, just in doing research about you know the types of e-commerce sites out there, we we kind of stumble upon this idea of a C2C you know used marketplace. So we actually, for our final project, we created a similar concept, but um, for a different industry. We actually created initially for the, um, like used baby products. So that that's a market that I, I personally have <laughs> <laughs> interest in. But <laughs> yeah, so Christian, I mean, when we were. After a while, we're like, eh, I don't know if I could stare at used baby products every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then Christian and I met and kind of brainstormed and, um, you know. Okay. So, so um, you know, I want to start wrapping this up. I have a few sure. final questions. One, um, what are some advice that you would give to a student considering doing a coding school, like full stack? Sure. And then what are some advice you would give to someone who is considering doing a startup afterwards? And then, uh, and you know, I'll end with one final question. So, qu qu Christian, why don't you start? I'll, I'll answer for the coding. Okay. So I remember. Um, I think basically, I, I believe everybody can learn how to code. So I was not the the strongest you know, candidate for full stack before, but I think I learned a lot in full stack. But uh, the the way I did it is I just invest a lot of time to it. So I remember this one TED talk about grit. Yeah. Which is basically this one teacher described how somehow students can be successful on whatever they're pursuing. It's not about their intelligence, it's not about their, um, their charisma, it's not about anything, but it's about their grit. So whenever you encounter this mental block, you just have to push it, just like through it, and then until you discover that aha moment. And, and once you discover that once, I remember I was doing this one framework, like uh, it was bootstrap. I didn't know how to use this, and why it should be used like this. And somebody just told me, I remember one friend told me, just use it, just read the docs and just use it. But I said, no, you have to know like, how to use it, uh, like underlining. And I started to de reverse engineer that uh, framework and I discovered my aha moment. Hmm. And then once I got that once, then it's easier from libraries to libraries to patterns to patterns and you just uh, continue to get better at it. So, so how many hours you know, let's just talk practically. How many okay. hours does it mean to be to have like the grid? How many hours did you spend here at Full Stack? Do you think? I I think uh, Full Stack at the time was three months and about like um, five days a week, right? Yeah. Nine to six, so maybe it's like seven hundred hours. But I, for me, I personally spend more than that because I stay up until late night and next early morning I did that again. I think it's about maybe a thousand hours, I guess. Wow. But to, uh, to get the first grid, the first aha moment, you, you, don't have to get, you don't have to spend that many hours. Maybe about like 300 hours. Hey, hey, hey. Oh. What? <laughs> um, All right. So cut it out. for the yeah. first 300 hours, uh, I, j I discovered my first aha moment. And okay. that's what propels me to actually go further. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about you, David? Um, for the first question? Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, for the first question. Um, advice I would give is to talk to as many kind of potential peers, right? Um, obviously try it and do what, you know, what Christian said and try to get the aha moment, but see if it's really something that you want to um, invest your time in because it's not something you'll learn over a month or two. You have to, you know, um, be very interested in it and it's an ongoing process. So. Um, talking to people helps, and then obviously you should definitely dive in yourself. So. And and what about the startup? 
what do you what, what advice would you give to someone considering doing a startup? Maybe you want to answer that first? Sure. Um, I would say a couple of things. I think going along the lines with you know, the interest, you need to have um, a strong interest in the idea you're working on. Um, and something that always helps is also to talk with your network. Network, um, you know, talk to other people about the idea because sometimes your idea changes or sometimes talking to someone will give you an aha moment and you add a key feature. You know, a lot of startups, uh, most of the ideas that they start off with aren't the ones that succeed. It's when they, you know, add a certain aspect, things like that. So mm. um, talking and, and be able to um, pivot as you go, um, you know, getting data points and being, you know, digesting the data points. Don't be so stubborn about the original idea that, oh, I want this to work, I want this to work. Um, but be able to make certain um, decisions on the product. I, I agree, David. It's uh, more about uh, keeping, keeping an open mind so that you can actually move faster and then, uh, progress faster. Sometimes, uh, you, you're, for me, I'm really concerned about the technical. So I, I spend most of my time like trying to make sure how this code works, but not only works, but works nicely and like fit and efficient and all that stuff. So it's easy, it's it's really easy to get caught into that stuff. But uh, I think you just have to keep a nice balance of um, keeping the code clean, but at the same time moving uh, to make it move uh, easier to change. Yeah. And then what about um, you know share with us maybe one of your favorite memories from Full Stack. Well, my favorite memories of full stack is when um, all the uh, back uh, when we were in the old building, it was really la relaxed and everybody just, I guess it was maybe not necessarily a good thing, but uh, people just came in their shorts and, <laughs> and sandals uh, and then just uh, uh, sit at the sofa and then they stay late at, at night and then just do the projects together. I think that was the most wonderful moments of full stack. You know? What about you, David? I think um, overall the the uh, collaborative experience, so that includes the group projects and also the presentations, was a great memory. Even now, um, with the very tightly, tightly knit alumni network, mm -hmm. you know, we still ask questions on the, the alumni Slack channel. I think that's kind of an invaluable um, experience. Yeah. So, all right, very cool. Well, we wish you the best of luck in um, all your endeavors, and thank you so much for coming in for our first episode. Thank, thank you. Thank you.